stats. I hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, today we're going to do the last section of chapter 9, which is all about hypothesis testing. Um, and so we're wrapping that up with some paired data and deciding whether or not a test actually makes sense um, using tests wisely. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, so number one, paired data. Why would we do a significance test for paired data? Well, paired data is when you have two different things and you want to compare them and see if they're different or not. Um, and so you might have a list of some X stuff and then a list of some Y stuff and you want to compare them and see if the um, see if there's a difference between the two of them. So usually what you do is you find the difference between each of them maybe this one's negative 3 and this one's positive 2 and you kind of look through this, right? If x and y are approximately the same then the difference should be on average 0 and if they are different then it's not going to be 0. So that's what your hypothesis test is. So eventually what you're going to end up doing if you have paired data is you subtract them, find the difference and then you're just testing is the difference actually something other than zero. So that's what we're going to be doing. The pairs are going to be related data um, and then that's what your significance, uh, your hypothesis tests are going to be. So we're going to look at an example. Um, basically this example is all about uh, a grocery store. Is the express lane faster? So um, you have two students, Libby and Brian, and they decided to randomly select 15 times during the week. Um, they went to the store, bought the exact same item, and then one of them used the express lane and one of them uses the regular lane. And they flipped a coin to decide who was going to be in what lane. And so then they just um, recorded their data, and then we want to see if there's a difference between the two, uh, the two lanes. So this is your uh, data. That, that Libby and Brian collected. Um, and each set of data, so 30, 337 and 342, um, those were at the same time, same item. So everything else is controlled, except um, one is the express lane and one is the regular lane. So what we want to do first is calculate what the difference is between each of the data points. Thing to not do <laughs> is change you know what what you're subtracting from what um, you have to um, be consistent so if you're doing express lane minus regular lane you gotta always do exp express lane minus regular lane you can't switch it around and always make it positive or something because um, then that'll really skew your results so let's do um, just because it's on top express lane minus regular lane and we'll find the average differences so I'm not going to talk through every single one of these, but we would just do 337 minus 342, so that's negative 5. And then we do 226 minus 472, which is negative 246. And then we would continue and find the differences for all of these. And then find the average distance, and then use that um, as our statistic. All right, that's our x bar. So there's all your data. You can go ahead and pause it if you'd like, but basically what I'm going to be doing is putting this into my list in my calculator, finding my x bar, my standard deviation, um, just so that we can do all of our calculations later. Alright, so I just entered all the data into the calculator. Um, I'm not going to calculate anything yet, because I'll do that in the do step. Um, right now we'll just state and plan and make sure that we have everything that we need. All right, so here's our state. Okay, we're going to be carrying out a test to see if there's convincing evidence that the express lane is faster. Um, and then we will be testing the following hypotheses at the alpha equals 0 0.05 significance level. Okay, so here's where we have to think ahead of time. Okay, our null hypothesis is obviously going to be um, h sub 0 is that the difference equals 0. Now, if we're trying to prove that the express lane is faster, Okay, keep in mind, express lane, we want to prove that it's faster. Okay. That would mean that we have more negative 
uh, differences. Remember, because we were subtracting our express lane minus our regular lane. So if our express lane is faster, it's a uh, smaller time um, than the regular lane. So we'd be looking for a negative difference. So then our, no our alternative hypothesis is that the difference is less than zero, negative. Now, if you had done the regular minus express lane, then you would have done the opposite. Mu sub d is greater than zero. So that's going to be um, your hypothesis test. Um, and then, you know, make sure you define what mu sub d is. All right, so that's our state all ready to go. Now we can move on to planning. Um, so we need to check our conditions. Again, random, normal, independent, same thing. Random, yep, we got it because we flipped a coin who went in what lane and the times that were selected, those were random. So everything's good on that uh, condition. Okay, so then we need to check our normal condition. And so for that, we have to plot our data because our sample size is tiny. Um, we have, how many times did they go? 15 times, okay. So we gotta plug in our data into our calculator, which is right here. And then we go and we do our stat plot and you can either choose a um, histogram, you could choose a box plot with outliers or a normal probability plot. Let's do a normal probability plot. Okay, so we hit that, we want L1, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's plot that. Zoom stat. Ooh, that looks nice and linear. Okay, so then we just draw that and we say, okay, since n is less than 30, um, we have to look at the plot. And since this is approximately linear, then we are good to use the t-test. Okay, so um, since n was between 15 and 30, we need our data to look for departures from normality. Um, the normal probability lo plot looks pretty linear, pretty nicely linear, um, so it's safe to do the t-procedures. And then we would go on to check our last condition, which is independence. And in this case, we're not sampling without replacement. Um, so we can kind of, because everything was randomly picked, the times that they go, um, we can assume that each um, time uh, that we got is independent from all the others. So uh, that condition is checked. Yay! So we have all of our conditions and we are ready to go. Let's go to the do step. Okay, check all of those off and go. Okay, in order to do any calculations we need our x bar and we also need our standard deviation of our sample. So we go to our calculator Stat, I've already entered all the data into my list, so I go to one bar stats, and for list one, I want to calculate. So my x bar is negative 42.67. My standard deviation of the sample um, is 84.02. And then we can continue from there. All right, so here's our sampling distribution. Um, the mean, it should be zero, because um, remember, we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So our mean zero, our standard deviation is S sub X over square root of N, which is 21.69. And so now what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the probability, what's our p-value, the probability of getting something as low as negative 246 or sorry, <laughs> negative 42.67, um, or anything more extreme. All right, so we have to find our test statistic t, remember, because we don't know sigma, um, and we're dealing with means. So we do our stat minus our mean, our mu, all over the standard deviation of the statistic. Um, so that was negative 1.9673. Um, with degrees of freedom 14. And so we need to go to our um, t table and figure out what the probability is of getting something that extreme. Um, so we want to look at the probability that t is less than or equal to negative 1.967, which is the same thing as the probability 
that t is greater than or equal to positive 1.967. There's only positive things on the, on the t table. So let's look at that. All right, so if we look at our degrees of freedom, 14, we're looking for the t value that we got, so 1.96, and that's going to be somewhere between these two values, so somewhere between 2.5% um, and 5% in the tail. Um, so regardless of what it is actually, it's less than our alpha level. So it's going to be, um, we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. And then we just have to conclude in context. Um, we reject the null hypothesis because our p-value is less than alpha, our significance level, and therefore we do have enough statistical evidence to claim that there is, um, that the express lane is faster than the regular mm -hmm. lane. Um, just as a reminder, I'll do this on the calculator again for you real quick. So we go to stat, tests, and then we are doing a t-test. And our null hypothesis is that the mean is zero. And then we just enter our data um, from the list. So our mean is negative 42.67, standard deviation is 84, sample size is 15, and we wanted to test that the null, that we're uh, less than the null hypothesis, and then we just calculate, and you get your p-value to be 0 0.034. Okay, so you get a more specific answer if you do it in your calculator. Still rejecting the null hypothesis, though. Okay, the next and probably far more important conversation is using tests wisely. So, number one, statistical significance is not the same thing as, like, practical importance. For example, Suppose you're testing um, how quickly a scab falls off when you're using a new cream versus the old cream. And say you get statistical significance and, um, you know, in your sample, like it happens to fall off a half a day early. Nobody cares at all that their scab fell off a half a day earlier. Sorry. Okay. Number two, don't ignore a lack of significance. So in this next example, they're talking about um, a, a new treatment to, that they think is going to reduce um, transmission of HIV. And what they uh, find in their, um, in their experiment is that uh, what they claim um, is that incident rate ratio of 1 um, means that there's, um, there's no difference between the control group and the treatment group. And so anything above one means that there's greater HIV in the treatment group. Anything below one means that there was a reduction. So what happens is in this experiment, they found their confidence interval to be 0.63 to 1.58. And if you were to do a hypothesis test, you'd find that, you know, since one is included in this confidence um, interval, that there is no, that it's not statistically significant. But the problem is, um, in this scenario, you could either have um, a, a significant reduction if the true value is 0.63, as low as 0.63, um, you could have a really awesome reduction, or, I mean, the treatment could be worse and making things worse. So you really need to do another experiment and do some more testing and figure out really what's going on. Okay, whoever performed this next experiment was not very smart um, because basically right, they went into a company and they decided to see if music um, in increases productivity of the staff. Um, and so they tell the staff that they're doing this experiment and that they're going to play music. And usually when you tell people that you're going to experiment on them, they change their behavior in some way or another. So they didn't actually do this blindly, um, so that was stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> Last but not least is be careful of using lots of different analyses. So pick one method and go with it. If you do a lot of different things, then that happens and it's bad. <sighs> And particularly in this case, you had somebody do a study, they repeated a study 20 times, and at a confidence level of, um, of a significance level of 5%, they had to uh, reject the null hypothesis once. But 5% happening once out of 20 trials, um, that's about 1 out of 20, which is about 5%, and that's 
you know, reasonable to happen in 20 trials. So, yeah.